ऋषिकेश हाय हाय श्रुति हाय स्वदेगा अर्षी अहमद कृतिका दिव्या दिव्यांश विनीता महेश्वरी सुजय मोनिका हादी हाय अ वेरी गुड इवनिंग ऑल ऑफ यू सो हाउ आर यू गाइस डूइंग सो दोस हैव जॉइंड अस लाइव दिस मॉर्निंग और दोस स्टार्टेड योर डे अर्ली प्लीज शेयर योर एक्सपीरियंसेस लाइक हाउ हैज इट बीन फॉर द पास्ट थ्री टू फोर डेज so from monday we started at 5 am club and also simultaneously we are having these dinner sessions so how is 5 am club going on so you are all are waking up early in the morning some of you so what difference did you start perceiving compared to your previous habit of waking up relatively late so as i said initially it will be very much struggling but as you know uh, initially after that struggle once you keep pushing yourself you need not uh, do that forever so you'll spontaneously wake up early in the morning even without an alarm it might still take some time at least 7 days as per studies 3 weeks so 21 days to form a new habit but 7 days it's like priming time you'll prime yourself to this new habit and you'll definitely start seeing some positive changes without any doubt so i hope you all had dinner so let's go ahead with our <coughs> mcq's discussion now <coughs> i'm really sorry my vo- my voice is not so good today because from morning i've been continuously interacting with uh, various doctors in fact i've been visiting a uh, paying a visit to various specialists on behalf of my mother so i've been in continuous dialogue and uh, just before coming home to have this dinner session i interacted with my parents and spent 2 to 3 hours of quality time having a dialogue the reason i'm saying dialogue is uh, recently I've, uh, i've been going through some documentaries about buddhism about buddha socrates and confucius so these documentaries are created by bbc but they are available in netflix so socrates has had this habit of engaging in a dialogue questioning people questioning the established authorities because when you engage yourself in a dialogue i mean it's not dictatorship it's a casual conversation an insightful conversation and when you engage yourself in dialogue it's going to be thought provoking and you're going to enjoy the process i personally would love to enjoy uh, in a dialogue that's what i usually do whenever i get time with my students so so i'm really sorry if my voice is cracking i, I hope you can understand so yes let's go ahead a very good evening so let's start with our mcqs discussion now i hope you guys are all ready and before we start as i have been reminding you just keep these three aspects in mind number one what a topic what a point what a multiple choice question you come across in this particular live session I assume that it's going to come in the entrance exam and second make a habit of making notes if you don't have this habit at least start making notes from these live sessions initially and then you can extend it depending upon your requirement it not be elaborate just bullet points or keywords as per your convenience for your reference at a later time that is during revision phase and third enjoy the process try to be active so uh, when i keep saying this <clears throat> the first thing i told you is like assume that these are going to come in the entrance exam does it mean these are going to come in entrance exam maybe yes maybe no but the intention here is to uh, make sure that you're giving utmost importance to the topics or points which we are discussing and that comes when we tie it up to the final exam usually in in the scenario of aspirants it doesn't mean that these questions are coming in entrance exam if so it means i'm cheating you i'm fooling you by supplying you with questions before the exam and that is that is something which a teacher should never ever do if he or she does it's a crime without any doubt so i hope you got my intention so just keep these aspects in mind and let's move on to our discussion and this session we have five questions maximum of 20 marks at the end of the session you can post your scores for review and make sure that you're enjoying the process because once you come across so many things see i'll give you a simple example 
In one of the questions discussed yesterday in last night's dinner session, we have discussed about the position of a retainer with respect to tooth. What if you place it occlusally? What if you place it gingival? So once you start correlating clinically, you'll start appreciating subject and you'll enjoy the process. And also when we were discussing case-based questions, many of you were asking about the threshold levels of uh, steroids, which are responsible for HPA axis suppression. It's good to see so many questions. So those who have asked you those questions yesterday, did you check out the standard reference and try to find out what the answer is? And for your uh, information, we posted some additional information in the form of notes in yesterday's uh, live links description box. Just check out video yesterday's last night's dinner session in the description part. You'll find some literature in regard to your questions. So you can at least check that now. Uh, it's never too late. So my point is, uh, have that curiosity. It's good that you're asking questions, keep asking questions. And just because you found out answers which are relevant for entrance point of view, doesn't mean you should stop asking questions. Keep asking questions and uh, that's the best teacher without any doubt. So let's go ahead without much delay. So first and foremost, yes, yes Sujay. So we have a variety of questions today as well, combination of clinical based, image based, numerical uh, value based. So let's look into them in detail now. So first and foremost, it's generally recommended that a span or space of dash mm is left between adjacent implants. So what should be the minimum space that should be left between implants if you're placing or planning on placing multiple implants. So what should be the minimum space between two implants? We'll discuss why there has to be this criteria of minimum space, but before that, what's that minimum space according to various standard references? Is it one mm, two mm, three mm, four mm? Yeah. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? So, uh, in fact, there were uh, previous entrance questions based on these areas. Also, there were questions on what should be the minimum distance between a tooth and an implant, natural tooth and an implant, between two implants, and also based on dimensions, various dimensions of implants, which we discussed in study club last year, just before the entrance exam. So, which one do you think is more appropriate answer? The majority of you are getting it right. We'll get back to the key, but before that, it's equally important not to place too many implants in a given space such that they are too close together. Why? This compromises the health of intervening bone and soft tissue and construction of processes. So this is very, very important. So this, uh, this is the reason why we have this recommendation of that a space of at least, as majority of you have been choosing, 3MM is left between adjacent implants and at least one mm between an implant and an adjacent tooth. The average implant is approximately four mm in diameter and between eight and 15 mm in length. I mean, you can get all these dimensions in Carranza. Also, this is just an extension to this particular question. So the recommended space of three mm is left between adjacent implants and between an implant and a tooth, it is one mm. Right, so consider this very, very important. And as discussed, if there is an assertion in reason, so a space of three mm is suggested between two adjacent implants, reason. So to make sure that the health of intervening bone is preserved, not just the intervening bone, but also the soft tissue. So based on several studies in vitro, in vivo studies, they will come to these recommendations. Okay, so just keep this in mind as. Majority of you have chosen option C is right answer and please award yourself plus four, if not minus one. Yes. Yeah, different references code different values. Yeah, you can follow these values. And if you're finding any of the information given here contradicting, just get back through mail. We'll also provide you a standard reference, right? So 
Option C is right answer. Well done. Now let's move on to the next question. The second question. Observe the instrument or illustration. You can also see a uh, various working ends, various orientations of working ends, straight, curved, one, two, three, cutting edge, and so on. So what is this instrument? Is it contouring pliers, crown remover, BB crown scissors? None of the above. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? Yeah, contouring pliers, crown remover, BB crown scissors, none of the above. See, uh, even if you have no idea, just by observing the illustration, you can point out a particular option. So you can see the working portion is relatively short compared to the handle, compared to the shaft, connecting shaft. So what is this instrument? I know it's a difficult question. Majority of you might have not even heard of this name, but you might have seen, you might have seen, I mean, that's not sure. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? I'm glad you picked on the clue. Well done. So this particular instrument, before I give you the name, it's used for cutting and trimming various materials. So it's a kind of dissecting scissor. For example, rubber dam scepter, provisional or temporary crowns, et cetera. And also you can see singularity instrument, the working portion is either, either straight, curved, or straight one to cutting edge, or curved one to that cutting edge. So you have these working end orientations. So used for cutting or trimming various materials as discussed prior. And as majority of you are choosing, these are type of scissors, BB crown scissors. The spelling is very interesting, BB. Okay, even if you don't have those E's, it is still pronounced as BB. That's a, that's a, a funny thing about English. Interesting and funny thing about English language as such. Okay, so BB crown scissors is appropriate answer and those who have chosen option C, award yourself, yeah, plus four. Okay, well done. Now let's move on to the next question. You have a patient, a case-based question, you have a patient who states that he needs a bite wing x-ray because it's been one year since the last fillings were taken. So previously, for some reason, maybe proximal caries underwent and uh, he got a bite wing x-rays done. And he says to you, he visits your clinic and tells you that, uh, dear doctor, I need to uh, get my bite wings again because it's been almost one year since I had my last bite wing. So what should be your response to this patient? Agree with the patient and go ahead with bite wing because it helps you fetching income. Or option B, tell the patient that bite wing x-ray should be taken once a year. So you almost agree to the patient. Or option C, tell the patient that dental x-rays are taken only when needed as judged by patient's needs, customized needs, each patient's needs. Or option D, none of the other. So is there any time frame that you should take bite wings periodically every three months or six months or one year, one end of it, two years? Is there any such criteria? I have no idea if there is any such criteria. I mean, if you guys have any idea, do let me. But usually, as majority of you have been mentioning, there is no such criteria depending on patient's customized needs. Usually, bite wings, we go for interproximal caries, right? So because of a minimal or a no vertical angulation, you don't have this distortion of a radiographic image. And moreover, it helps you in assessing the contacts and contours, provided you get the right horizontal angulation. It's, of course, technique sensitive. There's no doubt in it. But telling the patient that x-rays are taken only when needed as judged by each patient's needs is very, very important. So in this context, let me share my experience, today's experience. When I went to pulmonologist, since my mother had a history of tuberculosis and she was, again, started... Uh, experiencing dry cough for the past two months. We went to a pulmonologist, and the first thing he did is he, he uh, interacted with the patient, with my mother, and then he asked some questions regarding uh, cough, frequency, duration, etc. And then he used a step to observe, listen to lung sounds, 
And I was expecting him to suggest an X-ray, chest X-ray, because she had a history of tuberculosis, which was treated one year ago, almost one and a half years ago. So we were having this doubt of relapse. So I was expecting the pulmonologist to suggest an X-ray, but he says, X-rays are not required at all. Lung sounds seem to be relatively normal. There is nothing to worry. Just take an antihistamine. Pexophenidine has prescribed an antihistamine. Asked uh, my mother to take it uh, once, uh, one tablet a day for at least one week and then come back only if there is an issue. Rarely we find such doctors. The first and foremost thing that majority of physicians do is blindly prescribe medicines. Apart from that, even before prescribing medicines, it's the investigations, the list of investigations which keeps going on and on, which is very unfortunate. Uh, in fact, William Osler and other great physicians rightly said that the first duty of a physician is to tell a patient or public not to take medicine, but we see the reverse happening nowadays, not to complain, but we should always keep patients' interest in mind. That should be our only uh, object to our priority. Whether we earn or not, it's a it's a consequence of what we do. But if our focus is on earning, uh, earning uh, and we treat every patient as a money yielding machine, we're creating a kind of system which is definitely going to collapse. It's no self-sustaining model without any doubt, isn't it? So what do you do? As majority of you rightly said, option C is right answer. So do award yourself plus four, also we'll review some literature. So decisions about the number, type, frequency of dental x-rays are determined by dentists based on the customized needs of the patient. Every patient has different dental conditions and thus the frequency of x-rays is different as well. So patients have tooth decay, periodontal disease, tooth mobility, pain in one or more teeth or possible impacted teeth need more frequent radiographic examinations than patients without such problems. For a pediatric patient who is carious free and asymptomatic, the first bite wing should not be taken until spaces between the posterior teeth have been closed. Consider this criteria very, very important. Bite wing, pediatric patients, unless we have these contacts between posterior teeth, don't go for a bite wing, the first bite wing. Right? Uh, so uh, coming to occult diseases such as small carious lesions, cysts and tumors, these are those presenting no clinical signs and symptoms because occult disease in a perioral tissues is so rare, a radiographic examination of jaw should not be undertaken solely to look for it in an individual with teeth when there are no clinical signs or symptoms. However, every x-ray taken should be evaluated for these reasons. If you take an x-ray, then you evaluate, but for purpose of exploring them, don't go for uh, exposure, uh, patient exposure. So that's the bottom line message. So well done everyone, option C is right answer. Keep it up, so award yourself plus four. Now let's move on to the penultimate question. So again, dental materials based, let's see how many of you are going to get it right. So zinc phosphate cement, observe the illustration. So you have this zinc phosphate cement. So when you're mixing zinc phosphate cement on a cool glass slab, you add small amounts or increments of powder to liquid every 15 to 20 seconds. So this is done to achieve all of the following, except lower solubility, stronger final set, higher viscosity, none of the above. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? Yes, yes, Danish, Arshi, Dentist Q, I've observed your comment regarding this uh, flower pot. I really appreciate it. Yes, looks like a flag, tricolor, that's true. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? So zinc phosphate cement, we have videos on the same. We discuss them in e-classes as well as in YouTube, part one and part two. And this is one of the first cements which we mix during our uh, undergraduation, isn't it? So zinc phosphate cement. So a cool mixing slab is required, you know, to delay mixing or to extend the mixing time, right? So but this cooling should not be done beyond or below dew point. So let's review some literature and see why we're trying to do this to achieve what? So in the meantime, we try answering this question. So a cool mixing slab is usually used for zinc phosphate mixing. The temperature of slab should not be below dew point of room or else there will be water droplet formation, which alters water-water ratio. 
powder liquid ratio. As simple as that. So mixing should be started with the addition of small amount of powder to the liquid. As you can see, we have divided the powder into number of small increments. So this procedure, along with cool slab, increases the working time. So you'll have adequate working time. Nothing to hasten about. Small increments of powders are added approximately every 15 to 20 seconds with vigorous mixing until a creamy consistency is achieved. We have this string test, party consistency, depending upon the applications, okay? That's beyond the purview of this discussion. Uh, we'll just keep it out. So this process will promote a higher powder liquid ratio, thereby better strength of cement and a superior cementation medium by providing the following lower viscosity of mix, stronger final set, and lower solubility of set cement because of increased powder. So if you're going for luting, in the context of luting, right? So we have this lower viscosity, which can be determined by string test, stronger final set because of increased powder liquidation, also lower solubility of set cement. The advantages of using cool glass slab are a substantial increase in working time, when you're mixing on the slab and a shorter setting time of the mix after placement in mouth because of elevated uh, temperature compared to the cool glass slab, the oral temperature is high, obviously, isn't it? So which of the following? In fact, I've given you the answer in the process of this review. So we achieve lower viscosity, not higher viscosity, right? So option C is right answer. I'm sure majority of you might have chosen the same. Okay, okay. Don't worry, right? So this is a crown and bridge cement. It's a luting cement. We're trying to achieve lower viscosity, not higher viscosity, okay? So I hope you've uh, attentively gone through this review of literature, which I've done just now. If you need any further clarification, please feel free to get back from me. Just remember, zinc phosphate cement, it's a crown and bridge cement. It's a synonym. So just keep that in mind. Yes, as you can see, option C is right answer. And if none of you have chosen option C, then it's minus one for you. Do not get demotivated. Because if there is a question again along the same lines or in a reframed manner, I'm sure you're not going to repeat the mistake. Now, coming to final question, based on doubts which you express. Some of you have expressed some doubts for asking questions regarding the doses of steroids and all. So this is a test for you. So did you find out? If yes, I'm sure you'll answer this question. In fact, I've given you a clue in the process of textbook review last night. Let's see how many of you are going to answer it right in the context of HPA axis suppression. Hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal. Adrenal gland. So adrenal suppression occurs when the steroid supplement is. So patient, we've seen a case-based study, a, a question yesterday. Patient has, a female patient has erythema multiforme. She is taking a steroids, 20 milligrams per day of prednisone, if you remember the question. So we said we have to go for steroid supplementation because there is endogenous adrenal uh, suppression. Adrenal crisis. So uh, one of you were asking about the threshold value, like at what doses of steroid supplement will you start or will we start seeing this adrenal suppression? So this is the question for you. In fact, I'm trying to give you the answer through question. So how many of you think option A, option B, option C, option D is more appropriate? More than one milligram per day, option A, more than 10 milligrams per day, more than 100 milligrams per day, more than 1,000 milligrams per day. In fact, you'll find the answer in last night video's description box. So anyways, you can try answering now. Excellent. So as majority of you have rightly chosen, I'm very glad that you chose the right option since we had a discussion in regard to this last night. Yes, more than 10 milligrams per day. Let's review some literature where we'll definitely find some interesting information. The considerations for steroid regimen include evaluation of equipotent dose of steroid causing HPA suppression and duration for which patient is on steroid therapy. The onset of adrenal suppression can occur as early as one week after commencing steroid therapy. 
and usually requires doses of 10 milligrams of prednisone equivalent or greater equivalent or greater please make a note of this point therefore patients receiving physiologic replacement doses that is less than 10 milligrams per day in fact my mother received around 5 milligrams sometimes till 10 milligrams because of her uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpure itp condition she was uh, a chronic user of uh, low dose steroids 5 milligrams or 10 milligrams so doctor used to vary depending upon platelet count unfortunately that treatment didn't work that's the secondary thing but patients receiving physiologic replacement doses of less than 10 milligrams per day do not need additional steroids perioperatively beyond their standard regimen patients receiving steroid in a dose of more than 10 milligrams per day should receive physiologic replacement dose of steroid in fact several references are coding different values some say 15 some say 10 you can do you can follow this information because it's from pubmed indexed article standard reference article so similar to the dose the duration for which the patient has stopped steroids is also important in determining yeah, is also an important determining factor for initiating steroid therapy in a perioperative period if the patient had stopped steroids within the last 3 months we must treat the patient as if on steroids and continue with supplementation, doubling of dose and all, which you discussed in comments yesterday. Whereas if patient had stopped steroids more than three months back, no perioperative steroids are necessary. The consideration of dose for supplemental stress uh, doses depends on basic understanding of endogenous cortisol production. Normal cortisol production on an average, to make a note, it's around 15 to 20 milligrams per day. 15 to 20 milligrams per day, which can increase to 50 milligrams per day in response to minor surgical procedures. Hence, as you all rightly mentioned, some of you said doubling of dose. This is a rational behind that. So because of minor surgical procedure, a stressful situation, physiology is under stress. So there is more uh, need of steroid. And 75 to 150 milligrams per day for moderate to major surgery. So normal cortisol production on average is 15 to 20 milligrams per day, which can increase to 50 milligrams per day in case of minor surgeries or moderate to major surgery, it can increase to 75 to 100. So you need to supplement it in patients where there is adrenal insufficiency. That's the rationale behind this additional supplementation and doubling of dose, which you have chosen as the right option in yesterday's case-based question, right? So thus a dose of 100 milligrams per day of exogenous cortisol or glucocorticoids should be sufficient to sustain hemodynamics even if the stress would cause tenfold increase in cortisol production in case of endogenous HPA axis suppression. And regarding the steroid regimen, like how much doses should we give in and around surgery for such patients, you can just check out SDS description box. We have posted that regime. Okay. So I hope it's clear. And also on the right part of your screen, you can see the illustration of HPA axis. And also you can see the inhibitory effects of a cortisol on hypothalamus as well as anterior pituitary, right? So as majority of you have rightly chosen, in fact, I think almost everyone of you have rightly chosen, option B is right answer. Okay, so do award yourself plus four. Excellent. Right, so these are some other questions which I wanted to highlight in this specific live session. I hope you enjoyed this session. And if you have any questions, as I mentioned prior, feel free to get back to mail 24 by seven, right? So do post your scores now, I would love to evaluate. So how much did you score out of 20? So last night we've seen many of you scoring 20 upon 20 is very impressive. Uh, this penultimate question, I think most of you missed out the penultimate question, but that's absolutely fine. So what's your maximum score out of 20? 19 by 20 is an interesting number, but how come it's possible? I mean, uh, can you please explain? Okay. <laughs> Okay, 15 on 20, 11 on 20, 19.
I mean, I have this doubt. How is 19 possible out of 20? Am I missing something here? Anyways, I would love to know like how, how 19 on 20 is possible. But anyways, anyways, that's absolutely fine. So I really appreciate your frankness in posting your scores. And regarding uh, initial discussion, which we had, I said, uh, please keep in mind three factors. Uh, I said, the first thing is consider that these questions or topics are very important and assume that they're going to come in final exam. And, you know, there are some students who assume that coaching is all about providing material, which is going to come on the final exam. Day. If, if so, if that were the case, then why should you even have an exam? What's the point in having an exam? That would mount to cheating. If, we're providing you material which comes in exam. See, there can be overlapping of questions. There can be questions from the topics which we discussed. But if someone is expecting questions that are to be, uh, uh, or that might be appearing, or uh, with an expectation that they will appear on the final exam day, doesn't it mount the cheating? And also, we have around 1,000 uh, government colleges. And we have around 25 to 26,000 aspirants taking up the entrance. And there are some students, not everyone, and there are several coaching centers. Some students who expect a guarantee that they are placed in government college if they are joining in a particular coaching. And majority of coaching centers promising aspirants that a government seat is guaranteed if they join their coaching. I mean, uh, we'll leave about students because see, every student has their own expectation. That's absolutely fine. If you want to see uh, better versions, I mean, if you want to see, if you don't want to see those kind of expectations, it's the education system that has to change and students have nothing to do with it. They're part and parcel of system. But if you change the system as such, then everything else changes, including coaching centers, including teachers, including students. When I say change, I'm talking about this particular context. A coaching center, a coaching centers, are hundreds and hundreds of mushrooming coaching centers in a country like ours, where there is a billion dollar market promising students that a particular thing is guaranteed, mounts to cheating, mounts to fooling. Isn't it? Isn't that the case? If I say join my coaching, government seat is guaranteed. If I say join my coaching, First rank is guaranteed. On what basis? Just because I teach, just because I give materials, just because I guide students. So has it got nothing to do with a student's efforts? Has it got nothing to do with student's ability to give his or her best? Is it just about the coaching? Just because we pay money and we're expecting something in return. So it's a mere business transaction. It's like buying a seat. Even worse than that, uh, th these things are happening rampantly. In fact, I get several mails from students as well asking for guarantees. And uh, let me tell you this very frankly. First of all, I don't give any guarantees. If I'm giving you a guarantee, it means I'm fooling you. So just because I give you a guarantee, does it mean you'll get, you'll crack entrance, you'll get first rank, you'll go into government uh, college? Has it got uh, nothing to do with your performance, with your efforts? So what's my role? So defining roles is very important. I'm here to make things simpler. I'm here to make things enjoyable, understandable. And it's like, see, in a, in a class or school, if you don't get first rank, you blame the teacher saying that he or she is not teaching well. I'm not blaming students because there are hundreds and hundreds, literally maybe thousands of coaching centers in India at different levels who are promising students, right? Uh, uh, this system is very bad, is in very bad shape, especially in, in our states, Andhra and Telangana. Even I was a victim of it during my plus one, plus two, I discussed this several times. So uh, my intention is to tell you that if someone is guaranteeing you something, they're just fooling you. Nothing is guaranteed. Who is going to guarantee? I mean, my success, if I expect others to guarantee, then don't you think I'm considering myself very low? 
uh, don't you think I'm uh, undermining my capabilities? Why should others guarantee my success? It's a simple question. Why should I rely on others for my success? So if someone says guarantee, I blindly uh, nod my head and uh, just mug up those study materials. That, that's what you, used to happen previously. In the previous entrances, local entrances, uh, nationwide entrances, some five years, four years before NEET. But thanks to NEET, the standards have been uh, drastically uh, improving. We're having more of case-based questions, clinical-oriented questions, thought-provoking questions, challenging questions. So even if someone is trying to mug up entire guide, it's no way guaranteed that they're going to crack entrance. Ultimately, it's all about understanding subject and implementing the same clinical practice. Yesterday, some of you have asked me about steroid doses and all. It's very good that you're curious. But my question is, are you curious only to find out the right answer so that you would answer it right on the entrance? Or are you curious because you want to know so that you can implement the same in your clinical practice? If at all, you come across a patient who is on steroid therapy before going ahead with any minor surgical procedure like extraction or flap procedure, what would you do there? Unfortunately, as far as my knowledge is concerned, majority of clinicians I see trying to get rid of such cases, trying to get rid of such patients. What's the fate of patients then? Who is going to take care of them? You simply kick them from uh, one department to other department if it were a college. That's what we usually see. Not in all colleges. I'm not blaming you. I'm not generalizing it. But large majority, if I'm wrong, I'm happy to uh, be corrected. So what's our intention here? Just to find out right answer to the question? or to make real difference in the real world out there, not just for sake of posting our achievements on social media. What's our intention here? Because intentions matter, ultimately. Actions are a consequence of intention, more or less. Not always, but more or less. But intentions really matter. So what's my intention? What's your intention? As I said, keep asking yourself these questions. I'm sure you'll see a refined version of yourself on a day-to-day basis. So the reason why I've been trying to highlight this is, in fact, uh, whenever we start a new, new batch, <laughs> unfortunately, I came across these questions in multitude. Previously, there were several uh, questions. I mean, several mails in regard to the same topic. What's the guarantee? But nowadays, uh, you know, since we have been doing this work for several years, since we have been trying to, uh, in fact, when uh, I was in Switzerland, I made a video on this, like how many academies or coaching centers are fooling aspirants in the name of ranks. Let me tell you another thing now, in that context. If one of my students, see, we have so many students and we have the testimonials, we have several rankers over there. If one of the students has achieved a wonderful rank, so gotten into a government dental college. In what way does it guarantee your success? I mean, if you're looking for credibility, it's not the ranks that matter, it's the teaching methodologies. That's what one should be looking after. If you're simply looking at ranks, it's a very easy job for a coaching center to buy ranks. I can give you hundreds of examples, no controversies. I don't want to give any names, but I'm sure some of you might be knowing this. I know several institutes, even in one of the institutes where my dad worked in one of the IS coaching centers, where they buy rankers, 50,000, one lakh, two lakhs, three lakhs, four lakhs. Isn't that stupidity? And I don't want to blame coaching centers here. Why are they buying those ranks? It's because students, parents, society expects ranks only ranks. It doesn't matter what he or she learns because uh, it's all about grandeur. You know, it's all about tamasha that, uh, that we want to happen. It's all about show off. These are harsh words. I'm sorry I'm uh, trying to say all of this, but we should speak facts. There is nothing wrong in it. If not you and me, then who else? If we keep trying to beat around the bush, then when are we going to come out of this nonsensical rat race kind of competition. 
I know institutes buying ranks and even if they don't buy ranks, if suppose they get one rank or two ranks or few ranks, they keep, you know, uh, publishing it. This is very much rampant. This advertising, especially in our states, uh, I'm not very much familiar with other states, but especially in our states, they keep bombarding, literally harassing the public, especially parents with all these ranks. And parents are brainwashed into assuming that once they join that institute, the rank is guaranteed. See, I've, I've got my own rank during my entrance. In what way is my rank going to guarantee your success? My rank is my rank. My efforts are my efforts. My achievement is my achievement. I mean, what's this comparison? What's this nonsense? You have your own potential. You will get your own rank. And, you know, the funny thing is we have around 1,000 plus government colleges based on the stats which we have done previously and we can find that video and there are, as I said, prior 25, 26,000 aspirants giving. So if we are to see everyone, almost everyone experts a government seat, almost everyone. So to, to how many students as an educator do you think I should be guaranteeing ranks in government institutes? All 25,000? Doesn't it mean that I'm fooling everyone in the process? The number of government seats are 1,000 plus, or around 1,000. There are 25,000 plus, last time 26,000 plus, given the entrance. So what's, what's happening? So it's a very simple question. What's the intent behind all of this? We want to show it off. Then we can do other things. We can uh, go to Insta, TikTok, we can dance, we can do crazy things. We'll get all the attention. That's absolutely fine. There is nothing wrong in it. We can be an entertainer. That's a different thing. But in education system, where ultimately we practice on patients, when a challenging case comes, do you want to run away? Do you want to run away? Try to keep pushing patients. I'm telling you this with a lot of anguish because I had this personal experience. My mother, today uh, I had to visit pulmonologist, nephrologist, and a dentist, one of my uh, uh, guides, professors, uh, to get treatment done for my mother. So I visited so many specialists. And previously also, I visited one nephrologist in one reputed corporate uh, college who was trying to brainwash and orienting me into saying that, take your mother elsewhere and get treatment done. Because in that particular place, the treatment is going to be amazing. The reason is my mother has multiple systemic conditions, a tuberculosis patient, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpido, along with uh, BP, uh, bl blood sugar, uh, thyroid issues, and so on and so forth. And most importantly, she has this ITP condition, 10, 20,000, 30,000 platelets. So to go ahead with hemodialysis, it's a very risky thing. And the so-called doctor is a specialist who has specialized MD, DM in nephrology, refuses to treat, not directly, but indirectly, because no one has the guts to say directly or openly that I don't know or I don't want to deal with the case. Rather than, uh, rather than that, they tend to say, oh, this is a very complex case. There is no proper equipment. Blame it on someone. What equipment do we need for CAPD? We got it done uh, somehow in our same locality, Jayawada, in some other hospital. Where we are lucky enough to find an amazing uh, specialist, another uh, nephrologist, Dr. Hari Krishna. And it's not about, you know, uh, stop, we should stop complaining about or we should stop pointing fingers. And, uh, you know, the kind of uh, stress we have taken uh, during those times, this was uh, around one year ago, last December and all, just before your entrance exam. Uh, we were uh, going in and around several hospitals. Many are trying to push out, and we had this terrible experience. And do we want to become that kind of specific physicians or dentists? Or don't we have responsibility towards society? And what are these ranks and marks without any intention of doing good for society? Isn't this nonsense in that case? <laughs> so, my point is very simple. No matter what you study, no matter what you do, how, what's your intention? And are you curious? And why are you curious? Just to score marks, there's nothing wrong in trying to achieve good marks and ranks. 
I'm not trying to undermine it. All those who have achieved ranks and marks have worked relentlessly. There is no point in undermining it. I would be a fool. No, but ultimately, what's the purpose of these marks and ranks? Aren't we deviating from the very purpose of these marks and ranks? So that's the thing which I wanted to highlight. No hard feelings whatsoever, but I just wanted to share this with you, right? So let's let's stop it here. And so anyways, if you have any questions, you need any clarifications, feel free to get back to me. And whatever I say, whatever others say, do not blindly believe in what we say, what I say. I'm telling you very frankly. Question yourself. Have an open perspective, observe things which are happening around you. You'll and you can never be fooled. And you'll be a smart person in the process. And, uh, you know, based on your intent, you will uh, grow to such an extent that you will do more good than harm. Uh, that's what ultimately matters, isn't it? So I hope the session is uh, helpful. And I wish you all the best. Love you all. I'll see you tomorrow morning in 5 a.m. club. Right? Take care. Oh, 19 is typing error. I am very much clear. Okay. Okay, perfect. Yes, Pallavi, you are absolutely right, sir. Students' efforts matter a lot. Depends on students' ability. Yes, yes, Pallavi. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Danish, yes, exactly, rightly said. That has become a big business for their benefit, only fooling public. This is businesses, nothing. Ultimately, those who deserve don't get it. Yes, Rishikesh. Uh, our ultimate goal as doctors must be to serve society in honesty and bring happiness on everyone's face. Couldn't agree more. And it's not that money is not important. Money comes as a consequence to what you do. But if we're after money, in fact, that was the core of a discussion that happened between uh, me and my father, my father and myself uh, this evening. We had two to three hours of dialogue uh, in regard to this topic. Money is, of course, essential. Uh, with good intentions, we cannot fill our stomach. That's a harsh reality. But if we are only after money, I've seen, see, in the process of my experience with my mother's health, I've seen several physicians, several experienced physicians, and we can clearly understand their orientation. Money is essential uh, to survival. There is no doubt in it. But once you start giving your best, once you care for the patient, money comes as a consequence. Intentions matter. Of course, actions, intentions will guide our actions to a larger extent, isn't it? So I'm saying larger extent because even though sometimes our intentions are good, the actions which we do might harm others. So, okay, that's okay. But first, let's start with intentions. With good intentions, of course, you'll try to at least act in the right way possible. And with experience, you'll learn if there are there is any harm that's happening. And you'll try to uh, modify your action accordingly. Yes, yes, Vadina. Yeah. Okay, guys, good night. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. Uh, try waking up. Uh, I understand it's a challenge, but try waking up early in the morning and you will see how amazing your day can be. Take my word for it. It's okay even if you don't take it as I said. Uh, in fact, as I requested yesterday uh, or previously, don't just blindly believe. Just follow it once, experience it. And once you truly experience it by self, there is no way going back. Yes, of course, your yes. skills are very important and I'm sure you will focus on honing your skills with skills, with passion, with skills. The rest of the things will follow. Money follows, fame follows, everything follows. We need not really worry about that. Yeah, good night.